Okay, so we're going to get into an introduction of Docker. I'm going to assume that you really don't know what Docker is, but I th think it's a really exciting technology because it is truly a game changer in your development as a Java developer. It opens up a lot of capabilities that you can do because it makes things so easy. So if you have uh, a MySQL database, you can spool it up uh, just like that in a Docker container. It's all self-contained. So in uh, and doing Java development and Spring development, if you need MySQL, MongoDB, a message broker like RabbitMQ, it's easy to bring up a Docker container with one of those already preloaded, and we can do what we need to do as software developers without contaminating the environment. Now, Docker is not equal to uh, a VM, so uh, the question might be coming back to your mind, so what is Docker? So let me get into that. I've got a nice little uh, PowerPoint presentation here that I'm going to show you and answer the question, what is Docker? Okay, so what is Docker? So we're going to get into an introduction on Docker in the slideshow. So what it is, is a, it's a standard for Linux containers. Now, a container is an isolated runtime inside of Linux. It also provides a private machine-like space under Linux. And these containers will run under any modern Linux kernel. And it's important to point out that this is, this is very much Linux-centric, but it's also nothing new. So uh, containers have been around for quite some time, even under uh, the old Unix days. Now, these containers, when you're inside them, they do have their own process space, their own network interface. Uh, generally speaking, processes will run as root inside of a container. And if you're familiar with uh, Linux security, root is the most powerful user. And uh, pretty common not to allow things to run as root. And I did say this is generally speaking. There are exceptions to that. They also have their own disk space. And that they can share, the, a container can share disk with the, the host that it's running on as well. So this is all very important because conceptually, when your program is running inside the container, it feels to the program like it's running on its own private machine. But that is not really the case. It's easy to think of the container as a virtual machine, but it's not. And this is an image I took directly from Docker. And this is actually in the Docker information up on the web, unless they've changed it since I published this course. But on the left-hand side are virtual machines. Now you can see that we have some type of infrastructure being a, a physical hardware and on top of that hardware is going to be the operating system and in this case a host operating system and then a, a hypervisor to manage virtual machines. Now each virtual machine is going to have its own guest operating system with its own binaries and libraries and then its own application. Now the important thing to remember is that a virtual machine is just that it is a virtual piece of hardware so we're mocking out a pc or a server some type of typically x86 architecture so the hypervisor is making it seem to the runtime environment that it's running on physical hardware so that that's why they call it a virtual machine so it's a, a machine that's written in software so to speak. And you can see on the, the left hand side there's a lot of overhead with that. Now what's important about on the right hand side in the containers there is no guest operating system. The guest operating system doesn't exist so you're running off the operating system of the host machine. So you still have down at the bottom you still have the infrastructure which is being the physical computer, the the laptop, the server, the desktop, whatever it's running on, and then your operating system. And that, that can be a, a couple of different things, primarily Unix-based or Linux-based. Now, OS X has taken to it quite nicely because under the covers of Apple's OS X operating system is a flavor of Unix that Apple adapted. So the Docker stuff does play quite nicely there. And on Windows 10, there is a native port to allow that. Now, other operating systems will require you to run VirtualBox, which will bring up a Linux virtual machine for you to run the Docker containers inside of. So 
In this case, you'll be, uh, if you're running an older version of Windows pre-10, you will need to bring up a virtual machine running Linux, and within that, you'll be able to run Docker. Now, also comparing to this, uh, we have the Docker image, which is actually fairly lightweight, and then each side of the container has its own binaries and libraries, and then its own application, and they are firewalled off in their own container. Now, the key point of remembering this picture is that a container is not equal to a VM, and you can see in this image here, the guest operating system for the virtual machine does take up a lot of resources. So if you're running uh, three different virtual machines on one physical machine, this can get quite costly because you have to share or share the limited resources of the infrastructure or the physical machine that you're running on amongst all the virtual machines. Whereas if you compare on the right hand side of Docker, this is much more efficient. It really depends on what you're running and your workload, but some estimates are 30-40% more efficient in terms of your system utilization. So it's actually a, a fairly significant difference in how much you can utilize that, utilize the hardware. Okay, let's get into some common Docker terminology. A Docker image. Now this is a representation of a Docker container. It's kind of, in a Java world, it's kind of like a, a war or a jar file. So very, very similar. And, and then the Docker container is like the standard runtime. So I like to think of this roughly equating it out to the Java world of running an executable jar. So it's self-contained, it's running inside the GM, JVM. Now, uh, the Docker engine, this is basically what manages all the Docker stuff. So you give the Docker engine commands, and it's going to create and allocate Docker containers. So it'll start up those containers, bring them up, and shut them down. It will allow them access to some different system resources, uh, such as uh, directories on the host operating system or uh, network resources. So this is an image from Docker themselves I'm talking about the challenge and why this is important. And if you think about deploying out into the enterprise today, you have a lot of different requirements. So you have like Python and Postgres and Ruby on Rails and each at the top there, those are all different deployments and different things. And then we have the operations requirements of dealing with QA and data centers and production servers or development servers or developing on your own machine. DR, uh, disaster recovery, is a very important issue. You also have access for like contractors and regulatory compliance, especially if you're doing something like PCI or if you're publicly traded in the U.S., you'd have uh, SAS, SAS 70 to contend with, so all the access controls. So today's enterprise environments are very, very challenging, and they have a lot of requirements. There's really no standard to it. And Docker kind of gets its uh, nickname from, if you look at how cargo transport used to be done, it was all haphazard. So you had to literally carry cars across or individual barrels of wine or pianos. And it was all independent, so that there was no no standards for it. And it, it was very, very difficult not having that. And if you look at shipping today, where you have the container, it really becomes a no-brainer because these containers are intermodal and they can be moved on trucks or on boats and moved all over the world. And they can be used to transport just about any type of goods that are being traded and shipping. And that's really kind of the concept of the Docker container because if you look at the Docker container, now you have a standard entity. And we come from being uh, Java developers, and our standard entity is either a jar or a war file, or if you're really slugging it through with J2E or JEE, an ear file. I hope none of you guys are doing that still. But that is only applicable to the Java world, and it doesn't address like databases or Ruby on Rails applications and things like that. So the technology world is much larger than the Java footprint that we are comfortable with. Now, this has been a real game changer 
for companies utilizing Docker because it's highly, highly effective for, the, for them to use. You have companies like Google that are literally deploying in, uh, tens of thousands of Docker containers every day. And it's really becoming quite explosive in the growth. Now we can see back in 2013, not much going on in the Docker world. And then it slowly started uh, getting picked up. And we can see that it's just exponential growth. It goes from less than a, a million downloads to over 6 billion containers being downloaded from Docker Hub. And this is just containers, or I should say images, being brought down from Docker. So you can see that it's become rapidly, rapidly evolving. And the, these slides here are still a little dated. So we are working, I am working with Docker 115. So this slide is against 112. So things are, are moving steadily along and there's a lot of innovation coming out in the Docker community. Now, the, the last thing I want to talk about is the Docker runtime engine. And this takes a little bit for you to get your head around. So when you're running Docker, you're going to have on the server a Docker daemon. And it's not demon. It's not possessed. It's, there's no e evil exorcism way after you. It's daemon. So that means it's a background process. And, and this process is going to run with root privileges on your machine. And this is what's going to control all the Docker containers. Now, it is exposed by a REST API. And you'll see this more when you're setting it up on a Linux distribution. In the course, I'm using OSX, where it is. there's a native client, and it does make it pretty darn easy. But if you have to install it raw, you may have to uh, remember to set the Docker host and port that the daemon is listening on. So that, that's kind of an important step. And because it is a Rust API and listening on a port, it allows you to have your Docker client, which is what you issue commands to, talk to other machines running Docker. And it, as you get your head more around Docker, this becomes more and more important because having that capability allows you to allocate and work with containers on other machines that are running a Docker daemon. So you can bring up clusters of machines and cluster together containers to build out an application. So this is a, a kind of a really important concept. Okay, so now you have a better idea of what Docker is from the slides that I have. Now, I did steal some of these images from Docker, especially the one on the growth projections that Do Docker has been going through. If you're paying attention, you can see some of those dates are a little dated. Uh, I assure you that Do the growth of Docker has not slowed down at all. It's continuing to see explosive growth. I'm seeing it more and more in the workplace. Uh, enterprises are adopting it. and. I guarantee you, if you are not using Docker right now, or not already been exposed to it, or if you don't know somebody using it, chances are you're going to be using it. I'm seeing this roll across the uh, information technology space, much like virtual machines did. Because I, I did see the virtual machines come through. I remember we had these big NASA servers, and we started cutting them down into virtual machines, and there wasn't a lot of trust in the marketplace initially. And then uh, more and more virtual machines started becoming used. And if you talk to anybody that's running a data center now, they couldn't imagine running operations without virtual machines. It's just not done anymore. Unless you're like Google or Facebook running all this commodity hardware. A lot of enterprises are taking these very powerful servers, putting multiple virtual machines on them to run their applications. It's a very common use case. Docker is really the next wave in that. Actually, like Google, they run tens of thousands of Docker containers every day, so that is their go-to. Now, next, Next in this course, we are going to go ahead and get Docker installed on your machine so we can actually do a hello world or a hello world equivalent in Docker. So the next module is going to start stepping us through that. <laughs>